writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. We're your hosts. I'm Joni. And I'm Stephanie. So today on the podcast, we learned everything there is to know about Dion Audio, the world's largest independent producer of audiobooks. Dion Audio has amassed 12 Grammy nominations and five wins in the category of spoken word. And the world's largest publishers continue to turn to Dion Audio and their experienced staff to produce the highest quality audio content. That was a mouthful. I cannot speak today, <laughs> but it was a great interview. You managed it. It was a great interview. We talked to Jamie, who is the general manager, and Jeff, who is the director of global business development. And we learned a ton. They were super fun and knowledgeable about audio. They taught us a lot. It was a great conversation. I'm excited for you to hear it. So please keep listening. Thank you, Jamie and Jeff, for joining us today. You guys work for Dion Audio. And before we get into it, can you guys just tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you do there? Sure. Uh, So my name is Jamie Dupross. I am the general manager at Dion Audio. Uh, I've been with Dion Audio for 12 years now. So I've seen quite a lot of things happen over the years. And uh, I mean, outside of work, I am an avid backpacker. I do at least one trip a year uh, for a week with a group of friends. A big time sports fan, New York Giants. That's my team. Hardcore till I die. Really into history, but more specifically like ancient civilizations. I love that kind of stuff. I follow AI technology a lot, just in all sorts of different industries in different ways. And I'm an avid podcast and audiobook listener. Awesome. What about you, Jeff? I've been a part of the team for 11 years. Came in a year behind Jamie. I currently work in, as the director of business development, so I'm out, you know, looking through the world for authors and publishers that are needing some help with audiobook production. When I'm not working, I very much enjoy hiking, surfing, I play guitar, enjoy spending time with my wife who is floating around over there, and our four and a half pound chihuahua gizmo. And one more thing, would you leave out? Oh, oh my God, Jamie's calling me. I am a vegan. <laughs> I, I don't even, I'm not on my game today. I don't know how I missed that. <laughs> how long have you been a vegan? <laughs> oh God, I think maybe seven years, six, seven years. Oh, wow. I called it through eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> Usually the first thing he says when introducing himself. So I was so surprised right now. <laughs> Good to know. So can you tell us what exactly a producer does in the context of creating an audiobook? Absolutely. In very simple and broad terms, a producer oversees the production of the audiobook. So what this means, we start with casting. We're going to make sure that we get the right narrator on the job. They have the voice that the author is looking for. The author's narrating, then we're giving the author an introduction to the recording process, what it's going to be like. From recording, the book will move into editing, quality control, and then mastering to every stage to make that audiobook sound amazing, error-free, no noises, anything like that. Another thing that we do, that we take a, a stronger approach than some of our peers in the industry is pronunciation research. We have a dedicated team that'll look through the script cover to cover and uh, you know flag any words that might trip a narrator up. They make a sheet lay out the pronunciations on there, and then that pronunciation sheet will follow the book all the way through every stage of production. We also work to, you know, establish best practices and efficient workflows. You know, we're looking to see what's current, how we can improve things, and we keep an open line of communication with our clients, with our authors, with the narrators. We make sure everybody is on the same page and that the product that we get in the end is the product that the client wanted in the beginning. Yeah, and to expand just on a couple things there, Jeff. My personal opinion is I think casting is the most important part of an audiobook production, especially, you know, things, the way things are today, especially important to uh, get the casting right. Uh, Diverse casting, authentic casting. I mean, we've worked on some pretty amazing things recently in that regard, most recently being a Smithsonian Museum project where we had to cast some Native American speakers who were fluent in their tribal language, but also in Spanish. So that, you know, was quite a challenge, but that's something that over the years, over the 30 years uh, Dionati's been in business, has built up uh, quite a reputation for what we call unicorn casting. So when a publisher has just, you know, something very difficult to cast, uh, those always get sent our way. And that's uh, one of our specialties there, finding those, you know, rare, unique narrators that are able to, to do the jobs. Another thing I think that's really important for producers just on a daily basis to do is be flexible. 
audiobooks from the outside looking in audiobooks seem like they should be very straightforward and upfront and simple to produce uh, but they're actually extremely complicated there's a million different things that can go wrong uh, Deborah's been doing this for 30 years Deborah Dion and almost once a month she'll still say you know like oh well this is a first you know I've been doing this for 30 years never seen this situation before you know so every book is unique needs to be treated individually you know the author spent however many years writing this book and we need to do our part in producing that book you know to represent that so flexibility and just willingness to adapt to whatever gets thrown your way and still be able to get the production done on time you know hopefully is the ultimate goal there one of the one thing that that we do as well it might be a little i mean everybody varies everybody's a little different as far as producers but in regards to publisher involvement we let our clients choose their involvement level. So we do have some clients who will just send us a PDF and a due date, and that's it. They don't want to be involved in casting. They don't want to know anything until the master files are ready. The opposite end of that you know, would be someone who's involved in every single step. Uh, so is on location for all the recording sessions, uh, listening to the audio after it's edited, after the quality control has been done, you know, like every single step. And so we cater to that, to every client, whether it's you know, a big five publisher, a small publisher, um, self-published author, you know, we don't treat them any different. And so that's, you know, just something that's really important to us for sure. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the unique situations that you've come across, some of those firsts? Oh, sure. Well, so last year, what was happening a lot, um, which actually sparked a new position uh, at Dion Audio, a new management position, was the increase in author narrated productions. There was a huge spike in that last year. And for us being located in Los Angeles, and we do have a partner studio in New York City, but that's really it. So it's like outside of those two cities, recording was a difficult thing to do. Not many studios, you know, have audiobook experience, know how, to, how the recording process works. It's just a lot different than really any other audio industry. So we have a, a manager now who her full-time job is to vet, find and vet studios all day long, all around the country, all around the world at this point to where the author is located so that they don't, you know, don't have to travel to these big cities just to record their book. And so that was one like interesting thing that just kept coming up. And as the situations came up, it's like, how are we going to find this studio in Texas? That's like five hours away from the you know biggest city. Um, so like those types of challenges have been interesting. Of course, well, I'll let Jeff speak to uh, COVID and all the challenges that came there with the recordings. Yes. The COVID crisis, that, uh, that came on quick, and we had to make some pretty heavy changes. You know, we kept the studios as clean as we could. We had to take care of disinfecting them and staggering session start times and making sure everybody knows to maintain distance. But overall, a lot of people just weren't comfortable, be it the narrators or the engineers running the sessions, just weren't comfortable coming in, understandably. It's a pretty crazy time. So we started setting narrators up with home studios. If they didn't already have them or if they did already have them, we started using things like Zoom or Skype and some other tools to provide remote direction and, and actually remote engineering where we're controlling their recording software on their computer from wherever we are at home or at our studios. And another thing we did just in the opposite direction, but the same deal, we had narrators come into our studios and then we had remote engineers running those sessions that were taking place at our studios. And that's been, uh, you know, trying to get some home studios built very quickly. It has been a little bit of a, it's been a fun time. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> you know, you're, you're talking about narrators. A lot of people live in LA and, it's just not a quiet city and you know they're they're in street facing apartments or they live on a busy intersection and they really want to get that studio going but without investing the thousands and thousands of dollars to really get a quality booth it's it's so hard to you know get them in a closet surrounded by clothes and still keep that extra noise from getting in it just doesn't you know it doesn't work out we gotta get really creative there's a lot of great tools, you know, Isotope has a lot of great tools for pulling noises out of recordings, which really, really help a lot. But uh, yeah, it's, it's every day, every day we're helping any number of people get up, get rolling and make sure they can deliver professional sound and audio. 
We had that struggle too when we were trying to set up our podcast. <laughs> and I was like, to Joni, I'm like, I think we have to go under our bed covers just so you won't be able to hear anything. But she didn't agree with me. that. No, it got very, <laughs> very hot, very fast. But that was something I wondered about because a lot of our authors have their own podcasts and a lot of people have their own podcasts now and maybe have a little makeshift podcast set up at home. That's not the same, is it? No. What, you know, it's, I can explain that in a little bit of a, a funny way in the sense that Every single audiobook could be released as a podcast, but not every single podcast could be released as an audiobook. And the reason behind that is the standards for podcast quality are not the same as the standards for audiobook quality. When we're dealing with audiobook production, we have to make sure the noise floor is below negative, not higher than negative 60 dB. Whereas with the podcast, noise floor isn't necessarily as important. You know, if you have setting up for a podcast, you could have a USB mic on a kitchen table and if you're delivering great, great uh, content and you can have all the listeners in the world. But that podcast with those tools likely wouldn't pass audiobook quality standards. That's our setup right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, or maybe it's, it's super Joni's. common. <laughs> it's mine, yeah. I'm sitting here with my USB mic. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess... I would wonder, since you guys have been in the audiobook industry for a while, have you noticed, and especially in the last few years, audiobooks have become extremely popular. Have you guys noticed a big change or any major changes that you noticed recently? Yeah. Yeah, actually, there are some uh, interesting ones to point out. I mean, we're, I covered the casting a little bit already, but that, that is a big, a big one. Also, the diversity in the titles that are being created into audiobooks, um, which is amazing to see. Also, what I would add to that, too, is we're seeing a lot of now hall, like just celebrity attention. There's a lot of big time celebrities that are now narrating audiobooks. Actually, this past Sunday, there was a news uh, spot on CBS. It was like an eight minute segment on their new show in the morning all about audiobooks. And they were talking to, you know, all sorts of different celebrities who have narrated and so it's becoming, you know, more of a mainstream, you know, popular mainstream, more of that world. Uh, whereas before, when I started 12 years ago, uh, I had to explain to people what an audiobook was. <laughs> um, so that's nice to not have to do that anymore. Another interesting one to me, and it's, it's a big one, is audio originals. So things that are being written only for audio, so they won't be released in print. I just think it's super cool that there's authors and writers out there that are writing specifically for this format. I'm not a writer myself at all whatsoever, an actor whatsoever, um, but I can just imagine that process of writing and you hear, you're hearing, you know, the voices in your head as you're writing. It's probably, you know, a different experience for the writer, I would assume. And they make for fun productions because a lot of those audio only productions incorporate different uh, sound design elements um, that a traditional audiobook normally doesn't have and you just get kind of just unique and different perspectives and it's its own you know completely separate product than if there was a similar type of book that the author had put out in print but then they can kind of spin that off into a whole new product in audio and there's a really good example of that with cookbooks so like that's another one is books that were not really formatted for audio previously with the technology and all these different tools we have now, we're able to, f to make them work in audio now. Um, so cookbooks is a big one. There's a really amazing one that was done. His name is Marcus Samuelson. His book is really good. So it's almost like an, you're walking through Harlem with him as he's telling you stories about the recipes, about the ingredients, about things like that. And you have the whole ambience of the neighborhood, you know, in the background and everything like that. It's an interactive experience with smart speakers. So that's another game changer, uh, smart speakers for the audiobook industry. Uh, just last week, Dreamscape put out, they put out four titles, Dungeons and Dragons, where it's like choose your own adventure. Uh, we produced a few of those a few years ago for Scholastic. And, you know, so on the smart speaker, they're just a lot cooler because back in the day, I remember as a kid doing one of them on CDs. And when you make your decision, it's like, okay, skip to track 10, you know, based on what your decision was. But with a speaker, you just tell it what your decision is and it just goes from there. Can you explain what smart speakers are? Because I feel like I'm missing this. Oh, like Alexa or the Google. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, like those types of things, yeah. Okay, I don't have one personally. 
but they are like blowing up big time. And again, with COVID now too, and children being at home, they're being put to use a lot for children's and YA uh, audiobooks these days. Like the numbers that are coming out, that they're showing the data on it, it's pretty incredible. I picked up an Alexa like two weeks ago and it's, I, I, I love her. <laughs> I didn't realize cookbooks were now becoming audiobooks, which is no, really that's interesting. really cool. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So it's, I guess yeah. it's like a cooking show, right? You do it along with the book. Right. Well, yeah. It, that's what's so interesting about that example, Marcus Samuelson, but others too. Is there is the print version, which you can totally buy, but the audio version is completely different. It's a whole separate product than the print. So, you know, as someone who's a fan of him you're going to want to buy both. So it, you know, it's just an, another unique way to come up with an additional or add on product, you know, to the book you already have. What are some other examples where there's maybe a print version, but the audio version maybe has bonus content or is a completely different product? I know comedians, I think often add little extra commentary, right? Yes. absolutely. Um, any author who's narrating their book is able to go off script. You know, they don't have to stick word for word. Uh, so we've had some interesting stories of those uh, recordings, you know, celebrity authors who just, you know, it's so funny, like, I didn't write that, you know, they have their ghostwriters or whatever. And they're like, I didn't write that. Well, I'm going to tell the true story. So then they just go completely off script, you know, in the recording. Yeah. So that's pretty fun. Another example of what Jamie's talking about, we produced a David Goggins book and that was, I don't know if you guys listened to that, but that was a huge game changer. He came into the recording and in between the chapters, it was a narrator for the chapters, but in, the, in between the chapters, he gave extra content and expanded on what he was explaining in the book. And you're just not going to get that in the print version. And it really, I mean, every interview I, I heard on podcasts that he did, uh, Impact Theory, Rich Roll, both podcasts just stressed how important it was. If you were going to get this book, sure, buy the physical book, make sure you get the audio book because of that extra content he delivered. Yeah, for sure. You know, yeah, the extra content stuff for sure. There's some really interesting t titles uh, when that opportunity presents itself to have the author and the narrator interviewing each other. So you have the narrator asking the author questions, authors asking the narrator questions, and you get some, you know, just some pretty cool conversations from the, you know, their, the narrator's perspective of this author's book. Yeah, it's just some really cool content uh, for listeners at the end of books for sure. We have a situation just like that coming up this weekend where the narrator will be interviewing the author for some extra content in the audiobook. You mentioned that uh, authors were narrating their own books recently. Do you do anything? I mean, I guess it depends on their experience. Like, do you help and coach authors when they're trying to read their own work? Or how does that process work? That's a great question. Um, that's another one of those uh, solutions that we came up with when those started to increase. So yes, uh, we have partnered with an audiobook narration coach. Uh, she's, you know, industry veteran, been doing this for 15 years, hundreds of titles, award-winning. And so what she did is she developed this hour-long session that's done on Skype or Zoom uh, with the author. And it's specifically designed for authors uh, narrating their books for the first time. Um, so she'll have them record a sample of them narrating just like on their phone doesn't need to be good quality before the session happens and then so she can review that she'll get the pdf of the book and review the book and then in that hour they'll go through all sorts of you know all the narration tricks all the emotions feelings timing you know gives advice on all that kind of stuff she gives them homework in air quotes there uh, things to practice and work on you know before they step into the studio and lastly to prep them for the studio Going into a recording studio the first time, especially for an audiobook uh, recording, you know, can be a complete just shock to the system. It's a very unique way to record. So it's just not really done in many other industries the same way. Uh, so sometimes just people who come from other industries, maybe they were doing video games as a narrator, um, step into the audiobook booth for the first time to record and just kind of thrown off like, what? what's a punch record? Um, so just prepping them for all that because not only is it going to help their performance, but their confidence is really going to help their performance. If they walk into that studio feeling confident, they know what they're doing, they've practiced, you know, there's no really nerves at that point once they get going. You, it's night and day difference. When I listen to an author narrated book that we had the, the author do the coaching session compared to an author who didn't, you can just tell right away. Uh, for me, I can just tell right away the difference. 
it's keeping that energy up during a recording session. It's a long format recording session. So you can imagine getting in the booth for six hours. If you're not, if you're not ready for that, it just drags you down. And then the director really has to work to keep that energy level up in the author. And so that, that coaching session is a really valuable tool to help you get ready for what they're about to walk into. Yeah. It's um, just a quick story I have. So we do uh, the series for Scholastic where they have like maybe 15 narrators and then the rest of the voices are just um, people pulled from offices, just volunteers, you know, because it's a big multicast book. And one of the books in the series, I volunteered to do three different characters and it was two pages, just two pages. It took me an hour to record that with an engineer in the studio with me, you know, punching me in and recording me. And after that, I mean, again, I'm not an actor in any way, but still it was just like such a humbling experience and like eye-opening to where you can just kind of like bow down to these narrators. It's so much more difficult than you would imagine it would be. If it makes you feel any better, Steph and I spent 90 minutes recording the intro for a podcast last week. And that's about four only, minutes. Not even, it's like two minutes at most. And we <laughs> really struggled to do it. It was a Friday afternoon. <laughs> that's understandable. <laughs> yeah. Just thinking about that. Woo. Yeah. If an author is looking to cast for their audiobook, what are some of the things that they need to look for or take into consideration when looking for narrators? Well, we'll work with the author on that. So the first step is to find out what voice the author hears in their head and to get as clear as we can pulling that information from the author. A lot of them, you know, maybe they listen to audiobooks, maybe they don't, but generally they're just not familiar with the process at all. So you know, we have an author come to us, they want to cast a narrator, and we're like, okay, well, what do you hear? What kind of voice do you want? We'll get like a 30-year-old female or a 25-year-old male from Alabama, you know, the clearer that we can get with that, the easier time it is for casting. And we'll just ask more and more questions to really get it dialed in. We have such an extensive casting network. We're like over 3,500 narrators that we work with. So it's like, and, and all the information is in a database. So once we know what we're looking for, we can provide some really great options for that author or that publisher that's looking for casting. And then it's just a matter of, finding the one that they like the best. Another thing that we do oh. is uh, for casting. So we have like three options for casting essentially. So we do have a separate website that is just dedicated for our casting. So it's for our clients to use. So they go on there and there's a headshot, a bio and an audio sample, you know, for each narrator. Of course, you know, broken down into categories. Otherwise you're just blindly looking at 3,700 people. And so there's, you know, that option, which is the free casting option, essentially, is just here's our website, browse around, and if you find the voice you like, you know, we'll send the offer, good to go, no charge. Second would be uh, what Jeff was explaining, essentially just exchanging notes back and forth with the publisher, author, or both, whoever it may be, and our casting director, who is also reviewing the script to get his notes, you know, on, on the voice that he sees the right fit for. And so once they agree on that, uh, there's two options from that point. Both involve us creating a custom casting link. Uh, so, you know, from that website, the casting website, instead of looking at everything, the link we send you would be just the three choices, you know, potential narrators that we've selected for this job. And the audio that comes in that link can be um, either just the stock audio clips that are up there already on the website, or we can have all of them do an audition reading the same material. And then so they can make the decision that way. So you're listening to, you know, all the narrators read the same material. And you said that you specialize in these unicorn castings. Do you have that big a database that you have people who can do just about anything? Or do you have to do outreach and find those people? Oh, we certainly have to do outreach every once in a while, for sure. Like the Smithsonian one. It was actually great timing. We had just maybe a month before hired on a new casting director who had deep, deep ties into the Native American community. Uh, so that was, you know, a bit of luck and chance there. Um, but if we do run into something that is just so unique where we're just like, wow, I have no, you know, we don't, we don't know. Um, being in, that's just one of the advantages of being in Los Angeles and having the tremendous network that we already have. So, you know, getting out a casting call to 3000 actors, we're sure to find, you know, what we need pretty quick. And you are typically looking for actors to narrate. Is that right? Yes, absolutely correct. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with anyone who's not, 
you know, professionally trained actor uh, pursuing that. Um, but for us to initially get onto our roster, that's what we're looking for. But if there is a narrator that comes to us without that background, but maybe has 10 books already that they've done and they have samples that we can listen to and we review them, great voice, you know, things like that, we evaluate them and they can certainly be accepted as well too. I might have a dumb question <laughs> that make it. There are none. <laughs> there are no dumb questions. <laughs> so do narrators typically stay with one like publishing production company, I guess? Uh, no. Yeah. I mean, it's essentially they'll get approached by either the rights holder of, of the book okay. um, who wants to hire them. And in those scenarios, they're taking on the narrator responsibility and the producer's responsibility, or they'll get hired through a company like us who, you know, the publisher hires us to produce the book. And then whether the publisher provides us casting options or we're doing the casting options, that's, you know, that's how they would get the job from us. Okay. We have a question from Michelle, who you guys have worked with in the past. Oh, yeah. She says, hi, number one. Hi, um, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> so she says she remembers a time when Dion produced 700 audiobooks in a very short time. Can you tell us about this? And then I have a follow-up question is, how long does it take to do an audiobook? And how often, how many audiobooks are you guys producing at one time? <laughs> okay. Lots yeah. of questions. Okay. No, no, yeah. This is, this is a fun one. <laughs> this is a fun one, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, for Jeff and I really like, just the company overall when everything really changed. In twenty late 2012, it was September, I believe, August. I think August is when he got the call. So uh, Bob Dion uh, got a call from Audible, randomly just out of the blue one day, and they asked him if he would be able to produce 300 titles in the next 60 days. So 60 days? Yes, 300 titles in 60 days. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Bob, you know, his philosophy was, you know, say yes and figure it out later. So, you know, he was like, absolutely, without hesitation, you know, absolutely. So they hang up and then less than a minute later, the phone rings again and they say, hey, you said yes so quick to those 300. Think you can do another 100? And Bob's like, yeah, absolutely, bring it on. So 400, so we, have, we got 400 in that one day and that was just you know, from one place, not counting all of other clients, everything we, you know, already had in production, things that we hadn't even received yet that would happen over the next three months. It ended up being a 90 day thing. And so we did 700 total full production audiobooks. And not only that, this was in the months of September, October, and November. So, you know, holiday time. And this was before there were home studios no narrators had home studios this whole thing that happened in 2012 this big boom in the industry is what caused narrators to get home studios um so when we got this big order it's not like we could just send out 500 of them you know to outside studios and our resources were a lot more limited at that time we had one location uh with three booths at the time whereas now we have two locations with nine so it was literally for three months, uh, the studio was running 24 hours a day. I was personally doing double shifts, essentially two eight hour shifts, just back to back doing the day crew and the night crew. What we did is normally our editors, quality control, mastering, engine, you know, audio engineering, stuff like that happens from home. But we basically just cleared out this big room and just had a rotation of engineers just coming in 24 hours a day for those three months just working on, you know, everything and myself, Jeff, and another one of our guys, Philip, kind of coordinating everything and overseeing it all. Definitely slept a couple nights at the studio, had a sleeping bag uh, set up upstairs, you know. <laughs> but what I will say, what, the funniest part about it and the coolest part about it was when it was all done and over with, it was like around Christmas time. And I'd worked, like all of us, we'd been working so much for the past three months that we hadn't done anything like besides work, literally hadn't done anything. And then, so when that was done and I start to go Christmas shopping, I was like, oh man, my family is about to have the best Christmas they've ever had. <laughs> like finally, you know, like finally able to pay them back. But yeah, so it was, I mean, it was definitely extremely challenging, but we knew that nobody was expecting us to do it. Realistically, nobody thought that we could. And that's for myself and for a lot of us was the motivator uh, to, you know, just show people that we can do this. Yeah, so it was a, it was a wild time. And, then, and really, that's when everything changed. So that was late 2012. And then really early 2013 is when 
audiobook industry just completely changed. Yeah, what you know, what Jamie is saying there before before that hit, we were about a team of ten to twelve people, and literally overnight we picked up. God, it was like another twenty directors, sixty editors. It, we it, we just had to bring them in, train them so fast. And yeah, it was, it was no joke what Jamie was saying. We were there 12, 16 hours a day sleeping at the studio. Yeah, because that, <laughs> that was the thing is all, those, all the guys that were coming in, uh, the engineers coming in during the day and the night to do all the stuff in the room we cleared out, those were new people. You know, it's not like those were experienced engineers because uh, like Jeff said, we only had around 12 people at the time. So it was a matter, you know, it was just so much going on at once. You know, you're hiring five people a day, a minimum uh, for all different positions while also training them while also still producing these books. Like, you know, the real productions you can't put trainees, you know, like their first thing that they <laughs> do, we can just throw them up in the studio and have them start recording. Um, so it was just, inter- it was a challenge, you know, to coordinate all of that, just all the different moving parts within each different department and um, part of an audiobook production, training all the people simultaneously. Yeah, it was uh quite an experience but you did it wow. we did you know we, we did, did. And we, <laughs> we had a nice celebration you know afterwards and yeah it, it's uh it's definitely part of our legacy for sure it was it was great while it lasted but i wouldn't be upset if it didn't happen again <laughs> sounds like madness <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> during that time were you making like one audiobook a day basically or oh, more than that more than oh, that yeah, more i than mean that. you know i can't do math but so, I can only so the, imagine. Way, the way that breaks down is generally the recording will take place. It's a two to one ratio. So for every two hours that are in the booth, narrator is going to get about an hour of audio out. We held that same ratio for editing. QC is more of a like 1.5 to one for every hour and a half they're working. They'll get through an hour of audio. So you take a 10 hour book, you know, not counting the narrator's prep time. It's going to take 20 hours in the studio just to get recorded. It's going to take 20 hours just to get edited. It's going to take 15 hours to get QC'd. Then we got to do some pickups and mastering. And it just, so it, it takes a bit of time to, to get it all turned around. You know, maybe a week or so. You can do a 10-hour book in a week. Yeah, uh, the editing is going to be taking place right behind the recording sessions. Yeah, so that's something I should talk about, actually. So the, our production workflow was completely reworked, redone last year. And we've done some really cool things. What Jeff just mentioned, first of all, it's, you know, it's just very streamlined, almost like a factory at this point, to where as soon as that recording is done for the day, it's sent to the editor immediately, and they're working on it right away. And before, we used to have the editor edit the whole book before they would send it to the next engineer to do quality control. But now we're, instead we're doing it chapter by chapter. So as soon as the editor finishes that first chapter, they're sending it into quality control. And by the time the quality control is done on that, you know, usually they get a few chapters done before the next recording session happens. So that way they're able to provide you know, immediate feedback to the narrator and the engineer um, about any mistakes that you know, they're making, if there's any mispronunciations, just anything at all. Um, they're able to you know, communicate that on a daily basis. And one of the cooler things that we've done um, that had a big part in our re- reworked uh, workflow here is adding an AI service, actually, to our uh, post-production. And, oh, and you know, robots haven't taken any human jobs, <laughs> so that's not an issue. Uh, the company's name is Positron. They are unbelievable people. It's a proofing service, so a quality control service that is done by an AI program. And we use it in collaboration with our human uh, engineers. So essentially the process of that is when the editor is done, let's say with chapter one, they send it into Positron, which is the AI quality control. And what that'll do is it analyzes the audio against the text of the script and will note automatically for you any misreads. So if they said this for that, this program will mark that for you and note it for you. And this technology is incredible uh, for our line of work. It's a huge time saver. Our productivity, since we implemented it in um, late last year, like into every single production that we were doing, uh, our productivity went up 20%. We're able to do two more books a day than we were before. And the accuracy of the audio versus the text is night and day. 
Um, so what's something that's common in audiobook production is when a producer is done, they send in the V1 version one masters to the rights holder. And that's, and the rights holder then gets their opportunity to listen to the whole book start to end before it goes up for sale and make notes, you know, for any fixes, you know, any mistakes they find, things they want fixed, you know, things like that. And so what we're seeing since implementing Positron and this whole new workflow that we have, the amount of notes that we are receiving back from rights holders are either none, which is the ultimate goal, um, or just a handful of like really small, tiny things, you know. So it's just been overall for us as a production house, uh, for our company, uh, for all of our clients who, you know, are listening to all of our work, looking out for anything that was wrong. It's just been such a time saver, you know, for everybody and just has, it's making a better product, you know, and that's always our ultimate goal is how can we use the newest technology or whatever it may be just to improve our work. Cause there's always room for improvement. I mean, we've been around 30 years. That doesn't mean we can't improve, you know, I mean, that's just my view on well, life, I guess in general, but um, always just looking for just ways to, imp- what can we do to improve, you know? I guess one question I have is if you could give an author one piece of advice for making their own audiobooks, what would it be? Oh, oh yeah. Think about the voices that they want to hear. You know, when you introduce 75 different characters that, you know, each one is from a different far off land, that makes it nightmarish for the, uh, for the narrator. You know, we have some really talented narrators and, as far as the character voices go, you know, some have really just their voices can do anything. They can pull their voice in any direction. And other, other narrators are just, they don't have that. You know, their character development isn't as strong, but they're incredible storytellers and, and they get you sucked into that story. So I think, I think that would be the thing that I offer to authors. Think, think about those characters. How, how many of those characters really need to be in the story? <laughs> Are you just are you just shooting to get the word count up, or is this character really important? Even if it's a small but little part, it may that character may carry a lot of weight and belong there. But if you're just looking to take up some words, but find a different way to take up some words. Yeah, and I would also just to expand a little bit. I would say um, just to have like understand the expectations. So in in Jeff's scenario here, if there's 70 different characters uh, in the book that are that are speaking dialogue lines that need to be narrated understand just that you know it might we can certainly get one actor it's very common to do all of those voices it's very common in audiobooks that one narrator does that but there's just certain times where an author has a different vision in their head of how they hear it and what that ends up being what they just aren't aware of at the time but then they realize is that they're hearing like a multi-narrator production they're not hearing a one narrator production and that's just something that's really important to think about in the pre-production stages, you know, when they're planning out the production is the number of narrators that they need to effectively, you know, get those dialogue lines done correctly. Because there's just, you know, when, when there's a male narrator doing female voices for half of the book, you know, some people, you know, it's personal preference, I guess. Some people, you know, if that's the author and they don't like it, they're going to want that changed, you know, and that could have, that could have been something that was planned for in pre-production You know, we could have hired a female narrator to do all just those dialogue lines, you know, and the problem would have been avoided. You know, so those types of things, I guess, just planning ahead, you know, overall in audiobooks, um, that's our, you know, big philosophy is to do as much work as possible before recording starts. Because the thing is, you know, once it's recorded, it's recorded. And uh, we're not fans of the saying of we'll fix it in post. (laughs) That's not something (laughs) that we like to hear. Uh, So, you know, for us, if If we do it correctly, do all the work up front, put in the hard work up front, make sure just checks and balances times three on everything to make sure it's all set and good to go. The rest of production, you know, should be smooth sailing from that point on. You don't have to name books if you don't want to, but do you have any particularly memorable productions or books that you've worked on? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is, this is, I love this story. This is my favorite question. (laughs) So back in the early days, even before that audible rush that we got, before I really grew with the company, I was a QCer. And we get this book, you know, one day from Penguin Random House to the QC on. It's Justin Cronin's The Passage with Scott Brick narrating. 
and like, I didn't know who Justin Cronin was. I, you know, I didn't know who Scott Brick was at the time. And I sit down and I listen to this and the story starts with like a military unit in the jungles in South America and they all get killed. And then it jumps and there's, there's a lady that, you know, she lives with her dad, low income. She works at a truck stop restaurant. She gets pregnant. She has a kid, winds up dropping the kid off with a convent. Now, in the meantime, the government is like creating vampires. And one night on the way out, basically, the, the custodian forgets to lock up the cage. I'm not really doing the story any justice, but <laughs> they Sounds get out. wild. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, where I'm going with this is, you know, at, at this point in time, Dion Audio would do catered lunches every day for the team and the narrators that were working with us. So we'd all take a break around noon and we'd have lunch together and we'd talk. And uh, somebody asked me how the QC is going. And I start, you know, it was fresh in my mind at that time. So I could, I could do it way more justice than I currently could. <laughs> but I start telling everybody what happened and everybody gets sucked into the story. And this book is like 30 hours long. So like I'm QCing this book all week and it got like, I sucked everybody in on that first day at lunch. Every single day we broke for lunch. It just became Jeff, what happened? What happened? What happened? And I carried the whole team through this 30-hour story of Justin Crone is the passage with Scott Brick absolutely killing the narration. It was, you know, I've been doing this 11 years and hands down, that is the most favorite book that we've, that I've had anything to do with. Okay, we need to add the link to this book in the show notes because I think everyone's <laughs> going to want to read it now. <laughs> Uh, it, it's actually a trilogy. I haven't gotten to the other two yet, but um, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> Have you recorded the other two? I do believe that they're recorded. Okay. Yeah. For myself, uh, I would have to say something that's more recent from last year. It's like the ultimate nostalgic experience for me. Uh, we had the honor of producing uh, the book, The Good Neighbor, uh, narrated by LeVar Burton. So, you know, the first day he came in to record, I'll just never forget it. It was just such a surreal moment for me because that's my childhood. My childhood is Mr. Rogers Neighborhood and Reading Rainbow. You know, back to back every Saturday, that's what I watched. And it was just one of those moments, just standing in front of him, meeting him and just realizing like, wow, he's narrating, you know, the story, the autobiography of Mr. Rogers. Well, and this is the reading rainbow guy. Like it was just one of those experiences where I was just like, wow, what a combination. And it was my childhood, like to the T, you know, so it was just hit really close to home for me. A lot of good and nostalgic feelings. That's a really nice one. I guess you must have had quite a few interesting celebrities come in to narrate now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Weird Al was fun. That was definitely a fun one. We recorded Kevin Hart a long time ago. It was actually, was, it was for CBS. Um, it was like a, it was for the Final Four college basketball tournament. This is like maybe five years ago. He did just a, like a voiceover spot that we did for him. More nowadays, uh, when we're doing celebrity work, it's usually going to them. Or if they are coming to us, you know, we, we always, of course, take care of them, you know, get the car service and, you know, make sure whatever food that they want is here, you know, things like that. But we have been doing a lot of uh, remote recording when it comes to celebrities. Uh, most recently being actually one of our engineers, shout out to Brian Lincoln, went to Oprah's house and uh, recorded her there. You know, so he brought the equipment with him, set up a you know little makeshift studio right there and, and they recorded her book, you know, just like that. That is cool. Yeah, you know, so there's like opportunities like that um, that come up uh, that are pretty exciting. Another one that we did uh, in the last couple of years was Rachel Hollis, Girl, Wash Your Face. She came into our Tarzana studio, recorded that with us. A little bit older school celebrity, Bronson Pinchot, pretty much. I, do you guys know Bronson Pinchot? I, he was on a, a sitcom when I was growing up called Perfect Strangers. And that was how I knew him. But he, he's huge in the audiobook world. And for a number of years, he pretty much lived at the studio. He was just in every day recording something. I actually... I've been listening to a series that he narrated, uh, Extinction Cycle by Nicholas Sansbury Smith. It's like a seven and a half book series that he narrated and you know, it's a zombie type thing and he just, he rocked it. You know, that just reminded me actually of the other production that I've personally worked on uh, that I'm most proud of would be 
A Man on the Moon, uh, narrated by Bronson Pinchot. That's the one that I won the Audi as the director for on that one. Very cool. Yeah. That was for audiobooks.com. That was, a, that was a really fun title, actually. It was about the Apollo missions. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah super cool. I guess when you're doing quality control, are you listening to the whole book? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Do you it's speed it up? This, these are my questions. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you got to listen as it is. As it is. Absolutely. Yep. So what are you looking for when you're listening? What are the common errors that occur? This is just because it was my job before. <laughs> sure. <laughs> for yeah. ebooks, so I'm curious what you people have to look for. You're, you're keeping an ear out for any noises, any distracting noises, right? In the end, you want that audiobook. There should be there should be three sounds. There should be the narrator's voice. There should be room tone, and there should be quiet, non-distracting breathing here and there as needed. You don't want to pull all the breaths out because then it starts sounding like a robot. But you you know, if somebody got the wheezy thing going on, you don't want you don't want that breath to be present because it's going to pull that listener right out of it when they're like, <laughs> you know. Uh, so you're, you're looking to, to keep it as clean as possible. If there's any other noises that get in, mic bumps, uh, chair squeaks, any plosives that happen, those are things you're going to look for when you're doing quality control. Uh, Consistency-wise, character voices. You know, the, the character that shows up on page two for a couple lines of dialogue and then makes an appearance on page 575 with a couple more lines of dialogue that character voice should be the same. You know, they're not a new character at the end of the book. They're the same person. They've just been absent for a while. So you're, you're looking to make sure that, that the character voices are good. Another, another sort of joke that we, we make in audiobook production is that the best book editors, not audiobook editors, but book editors are the audiobook producers because we find all the things that slip by the editors consistent you know if it's a typo we'll find it if it's the wrong word we'll find it if the car is blue in the beginning but turns yellow by the end and doesn't get a mention of a paint job anywhere we pick up on that stuff if a character you know if the wrong character name is placed after a line of dialogue that's the stuff we're going to pick up during quality control it's really like you you have to have the ability to focus, like heavily, heavily focus on something for a really long period of time in order to do QC on an audiobook. Because you're, you're looking for so many, so many different things. And you can't, there's no one behind you. After you, it goes to Matt, it, you know, it, it goes to the public. Yep. And there's, there's one quick, uh, interesting story that happened maybe last year, less than a year ago. Uh, it was a high profile title and our editor was working on it and they noticed that the defendant had then later turned into the plaintiff in the book. And this was something that was based on, this was a uh, true story. So we immediately flagged that, you know, sent it over to the publisher and they were, you know, just so thankful that it was something that we caught because it was currently getting printed. So they had to halt the production on the print, oh, you, know, wow. revise, you know, revise the script and then, you know, restart the print version again, you know, all over. So, you know, there are those situations, uh, like Jeff is mentioning, where we are also just kind of a fail safe for the, for the editor of the book, you know, the print book. Well, oh, because you're fresh eyes on it as well. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. You know, and that's one of the things that varies producer by producer, essentially, is, of course, the workflow, but how many people are listening to the book from start to end, how many different people, and in how many different stages. And I think that's one of the things that I really like about what we do, at minimum, any single book that we are doing a full production on, at minimum, will have gone through seven full passes of the book by different people. So looking whether it's editing or during, you know, one of those being during the recording. So the director who's there with the engineer or with the narrator, they're obviously listening to the whole book because, you know, while they're recording, if they notice that they messed up on anything, they're stopping them. They go back to the top of the sentence and, you know, start from there. So seven minimum counting the recording uh, pass. And, you know, just depending on the project, it may need uh, maybe more passes than that. We may use Positron, the uh, AI proofing service, you know, multiple times, um, up to like three, four times on a job, just at various stages, sometimes even including recording. Is That's another one of those interesting solutions to problems that come up where you have, whether it's an actor, and most of the time a celebrity or an author who has limited availability, you know, it's like this is when they can record after this last day when they finish, they're not available. 
you know, they're not going to be able to come back for pickups, things like that. So having like that AI service, Positron, being able to give us quality control reports in a matter of hours on just raw recorded audio so that daily when they come in to record, including that last day, you know, we can get them to record the pickups, at least that the AI is catching up to that point. You know, our engineers can only go so fast, uh, but the AI is like, you can get hours of audio processed in like 20 minutes. Yeah, so it's like at the end of the last day, when that narrator is going to leave, we just simply ask them beforehand, you know, if they don't mind hanging out for 20 minutes when their session is done, so we can run it through, get the report and see if there's any uh, last pickups for them to record. And so that's been awesome because before it was always an issue was that last day of audio was like, we ha- it has to be perfect because they're not coming back, you know, or we have to pull some magic with editing to fix the mistakes in that day. But now we've come up with a solution to just do it right then and there, you know, so it's not a, not an issue anymore. Feel that stress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> making sure it's right. <laughs> <laughs> What's your opinion on AI narration or narrators? Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, I have a lot of different opinions on it. I mean, I think it's nothing that narrators need to worry about in the U.S. whatsoever, long term, short term. The union for the narrators uh, for actors SAG after is extremely strong. I don't think that the union would ever let anything catastrophic happen. That said. I mean, at least for right now, long form narration with AI voices starts to sound terrible after a couple minutes. Short form stuff still, if you're an audio person, like I'm an audio engineer by trade. That's how I started in this industry. So to someone like myself, I can just hear certain things that I know it's not a real voice it kind of bothers me. But there are, some, there are some companies that are pretty good at short. If it's just like 30 seconds or a minute long, they can pull it off uh, to where it's pretty convincing that it's a human. Overall, somehow, some way, it will get incorporated into the industry. But I, as of right now, in 2020, I'm just not sure if I see it being to where full 10-hour books are being narrated by some sort of AI voice. This makes I'm me gonna... feel validated. I've been. Well, yeah, gonna... That's what I always <laughs> think. It's, I don't know. I flip flop all the time. I I don't know. So it's it's an interesting conversation to have, and I just have so many different views on it so it's hard yeah to- i keep hearing but they're really good and i'm like are they really i'm gonna i'm gonna counter a little bit of what jamie was saying i think you know looking at a broader perspective we've seen the robots come in and hit every single industry you know manufacturing automobiles whatever it is at that initial entry when they first start coming in there's a lot of backlash they're taking jobs it's bad for the people but over time you know the culture adjusts and we learn to work with the robots, you know, so I'm talking like Terminator stuff here or something, but, uh, <laughs> but we're seeing companies like deep Zen is doing some long format AI stuff where they take a narrator sample and they can make that narrator read an entire 10 hour book with just a few minutes of audio that they actually narrated. And they've learned how to incorporate emotion into, into the AI that's reproducing that voice. And this isn't, you know, I, we're at that stage right now where they're getting a bit of backlash from the community. I'm probably going to get a little bit of backlash for saying this, <laughs> but uh, it, it is what it is. You know, I think there's a bright future and I think it's just a matter of everybody learning how to work together with AI. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think it's, that's exactly it is figuring, I, I don't know how this would work, but you know, the compensation for the narrators who choose to participate in something like that is, you know, I think as long as they're compensated, you know, their voice is being used as long as they're compensated somehow, some way, it's not a problem. The thing for me about long form though, when it comes to AI, at least right now with the technology, when you get into like character voices or accents, um, foreign language, even if it's just foreign language terms within an English book, those are the types of things I'm interested to see how those would sound. You know, how a AI is going to generate from a voice bank. You know, they have this narrator's voice banked, but how would they pull off a character voice, especially of, a, of the different gender, you know? So I don't know. I mean, there's endless possibilities is what I would say. Every time I think, you know, oh, this ain't going to happen for five years, you know, then things like Descript uh, come around. Um, that's another really interesting one. It's not necessarily AI as in voice synthesis, but it could end up revolutionizing the way audiobooks are produced. You know, I mean, there's, there's just so many different things out there at this moment, whether they're established, they're starting up, 
of course, like, you know, ideally for us, we'd try to get in when they're like Kickstarter status. It's, it's just going to be very interesting to see how it's all going to play out for sure. Descript is, a, is an interesting one. If, if you haven't heard of that one, I'd recommend looking into it. It's more for podcasts at the moment, but they are working on things that will translate to audiobook production that are pretty exciting. What do they do right now for podcasts? So it's essentially a software um, for recording uh, your podcast, for the whole thing. So recording, editing, mastering it, and then publishing it, getting it out there in the world. What's interesting about it, what's different about it is it's, as you're recording, it's transcribing the audio into text that you're looking at. So you're looking at the audio on the bottom of the screen, the waveforms that you're recording. And then on the top part of the screen, you're looking at, looks like a Word document. And it's being filled in as the recording is going. It's transcribing that audio, putting it into written text. And then the editing, for example, like with podcasts, if there's a lot of uhs and ums and things like that going on, you can highlight just, and with one click, you can have them all removed from the audio. So you're like editing the audio by editing the text. So whatever you do in the text, the audio is then going to the brain editor. has exploded that sounds yes yeah, exactly it's, it's <laughs> so you know there's countless things like this that's part of like what jeff and i do or you know we're daily following these things reading up on them doing webinars uh, networking beta testing i've done a lot of beta testing for these companies just because i really believe in the technology i think it can be extremely powerful it can be extremely helpful in production just to make everybody make the product better listeners happier it's just, it can have a huge impact on everything and the way that i like to look at it too is is not i'm always looking for the solutions that the ai is not replacing a job it is an additional add-on tool and that's how i like to look at positron for our quality control because of course you know the our human engineers are still listening from the book start to end. It's just that they have this tool that they can use to help that will mark all of the easy, you know, misreads said this for that, you know, it does all that easy work for them. That is pretty time consuming, you know, to mark every single one of those is time consuming. So to have a program that does it in a couple seconds, you know, so things like that are always what I'm looking out for. So we'll see, you know, with Descript and Deep Zen and uh, countless others, uh, where it all goes. It's the Wild West right now out there in that world, though, to be honest. And it's, it's going to be very, very interesting. It's uh-huh. a good way of looking at it, though, because things like Word, like using fine change in Word, that's technology that human editors are still using to speed up what they're doing or anything really related mm. to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm excited. I think that's what I am driven on and look forward to a lot in the future um, and just on a daily basis is I do just a lot of reading. I subscribe to a lot of different outlets and just reading up on the technology, staying up on it and just seeing what, what's the next cool thing that, that we can do to try to get ahead of the curve, start pitching it to people, you know, and get people on board with it and be the first ones, you know, who are doing that. So we're the go-to people for X, Y, Z, whatever that may be, you know, one of the ultimate goals that I'm always striving for. We also talk about how audiobooks right now don't have really like specifications, like an EPUB can fail because it's not validated, but like that doesn't exist for an audiobook. So like, I think one of the initiatives of Kobo is to like figure out what that would look like. Like, Mm -hmm. could an audiobook be one file somewhere? So yeah, who knows? I'm really curious to see what happens in the next five years with audiobooks. Yeah, Yeah. we're right there with you. (laughs) Do you have any resources you would recommend if people are interested in seeing, learning more about audiobooks or like the technology that's associated? You can, like, the ACX platform is huge for, there's a lot of information there for narrators that are just getting started. Uh, There's a lot of Facebook groups for narrators that talk about, you know, they're all working together. They're all helping each other. So if you have somebody that's, like, looking to get into that side of it, those are a couple of places they could look. Would the question be like uh, maybe an author looking to get a book produced or like a narrator looking to get into the industry? Yeah, I would say either or, or just like audiobook news can exist oh, okay. somewhere. Sure. I don't know, it depends. It depends. I don't know what's out there really. If you have anything that you recommend or that you read every day or something like that. Yeah, I highly recommend two things. First, Google Alerts. I learned about Google Alerts about a year ago and it has changed my life. Yeah, I get 20, 30 articles sent to me a day through those things. So those are amazing. Right now, 
I'm still exploring a bunch of different uh, news source websites for the publishing industry, but I really like one called The Bookseller. Um, it's based in the UK, and it is a paid subscription. I think it only comes with like three free articles a week. I really like them because they seem to analyze and come and analyze news at different angles that I didn't see before and that I'm not seeing really reported anywhere else, which is always super interesting and, and just great to see that. So I really like them. There's another one called the, uh, well, Jeff mentioned ACX. It is a good place to, to get some information and learn things about. Publishers Marketplace is another pretty decent one. And the last one that I would recommend, Publishing Executive. That website is really, really good as well. Good to know. We'll include all of those links when we put this out. Could you also tell us, our listeners, where they can find you and your website? Absolutely. Uh, so DeonAudio.com. Yeah, <laughs> DeonAudio.com. That's D-E-Y-A-N audio.com. Um, that's where you will find us. And then, of course, we are on you know Facebook, Twitter, all that. Instagram. Instagram, all at Dion Audio. I think we're on Instagram a little more than we're on Twitter. Good to yeah. know. And besides that, our Myself and Jeff um, are the contacts and go-to people um, for any inquiries. And our email addresses are extremely simple. Just our first name, <laughs> at DionAudio.com. So Jeff, at DionAudio.com. And Jamie, spelled J-A-M-I-E, at DionAudio.com. And we are happy to help with anything. Any questions, um, anybody at all. You know, we're always here and happy to help. Great. Perfect. We will have this all written out for anyone listening and panicking that they don't have a pen it will all be on our blog <laughs> awesome also you should even if you are not producing an audiobook right now you should go and listen to all the narrator samples because it's actually quite compelling to go through all of the different categories and listen to people talking and yeah i find it fun awesome, awesome. that's great i'm glad it's being put to good use do you guys have anything else to add Oh, no, just thank you. We're very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you both so much. I uh, really enjoyed this conversation. It was fun. Yeah, same. I've, I've enjoyed talking to the both of you. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Yeah. I'll ask you how when you have to do 700 audiobooks again. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. We'll be the first person we call. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast. If you're looking for more information about Dion Audio or extra tips on learning how to grow your sales, visit KoboWritingLife.com. This episode was produced by Stephanie McGrath and Joni DiPlacido. Editing is by Kelly Robotham. Music is provided by Tearjerker. And big thanks to Jamie and Jeff for being guests today. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at Kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing. <laughs>